We're glad to see everyone here today. My name is Audrey Trushke. I am Associate Professor of South Asian History here at Rutgers University in Newark, New Jersey. I am here to facilitate and moderate a discussion with Yashika Dutt on caste prejudices and her award-winning book titled Coming Out as Dalit. This is an event that's co-sponsored by both the Chancellor's Office here at Rutgers Newark, as well as the Federated Department of History. And I'm grateful to, to both the Chancellor's Office and, and my own department for their support of this critical conversation about the pernicious influence of caste-based prejudices. So our agenda for today is as follows. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Ms. Yashika Dutt. Then Yashika is going to read a passage from, from her, her memoir, really memoir plus, say more on that in a moment, coming out as, as Dalit. After her reading, I'll, she and I will do a sort of back and forth Q&A for 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll reserve about 20 to 25 minutes at the end for audience questions. So before turning over the floor, let me introduce our, our honored speaker. Yashika Dutt is a journalist, she's a writer, and she is an anti-caste activist. She spent much of her life hiding that she is Dalit, okay? Meaning that she's part of a group at the bottom of India's unforgiving system of social stratification known as the caste system. And then in 2016, Ms. Dutt decided to come out, and that's her language, to come out as Dalit in a social media post. That post changed much about her life and her perceived identity going forward. Ms. Dutt soon wrote about her upbringing, about hiding her caste background, find, and finding empowerment in owning her caste identity in her book, published in 2019, Coming Out as Dalit. The book is wonderful. I wholeheartedly recommend it to all of you. And what, one thing it does is it sort of intertwines Yashika's personal story with a much broader history of the Dalit movement and pushback against caste-based discrimination. Much of Yashika's story takes place in India, but she's also lived for years in the United States. And it is important that we all recognize that caste and caste-based privileges are a global problem, including right here in the state of New Jersey. It is never easy to talk about prejudice, especially when you're on the receiving end of it. And so I now turn you all over to a notably brave woman with unimpeachable integrity, Ms. Yashika Dutt. Uh, thank you so much for that excellent um, you know, introduction, Audrey. I'm really glad to be here. Uh, we were just talking right before we went live that Rutgers uh, being situated in New Jersey is such an important site for conversations around caste, especially as you know, the South Asian diaspora is gaining more prominence all over the country. And uh, you know, we are gaining more visibility. We are gaining in many ways some power that we didn't have before. But you know, as the important and powerful code goes, with power comes responsibility. And uh, it's really high time that the South Asian diaspora and the Indian diaspora in particular really looks inwards and talks about how caste has been brushed under the rug for decades and why that's happening and why is it has it taken this high profile case where a brave Dalit engineer had to put his life, his livelihood on the line to take his employers to court for us to talk about caste. So that's why we are here today. I'm really excited to join you. And uh, like you mentioned earlier, I'm going to read from my book, Coming Out as Dalit. Um, this is a memoir plus. That's a great description, actually, because it's a nonfiction account of many stories like me. It's not just the story of how one person, that is me, you know, came out as Dalit or accepted my Dalit identity, but so many people like us who are forced to hide our past, who are forced to hide who we are and the toll that it takes, especially when everybody around us is denying that caste even exists, where our lives are a living testimony and our trauma is a, <clears throat> is a testimony 
to what caste does to us. So I'll just dive into this chapter. It's called The Argument for Reservation. Now, the reason I chose this chapter, it's because it's really the connecting tissue between um, India and the United States. And that's evident because a lot of the talent pool that comes in the United States from India because of US laws is based in tech-based industries. And a lot of that talent pool also comes from the notable and famous engineering and medical colleges in India, where this issue of caste-based reservation and the protest around it and the discrimination of Dalit students is most visible. Is, uh, and also the idea whether somebody availed reservation back home in India carries through to the United States. It, it is used as a tool for discrimination against Dalits who availed affirmative action on the United States soil. So that's why this chapter I feel will speak to our attendees, our viewers, your students, Audrey, who might be interested in learning how exactly does caste operate and why does it hold so much importance even today? So we're going to dive into this. It's called the argument for reservation. Through the three years I spent at St. Stephen's, I was worried about people finding out about my caste only when the result lists went up on the notice boards and my name was tucked under the SCST category or towards the end of the course when my classmates began discussing how easy it would be for a reserved category student to get into a good MBA college. I stayed silent through most of these discussions because I didn't know how to tell them why that wasn't true. I wasn't entirely sure myself how reservations worked, but I felt deeply ashamed. I felt deeply ashamed about grabbing the resources that belonged, about grabbing the resources that belonged to those that rightfully deserved them. I had internalized the argument that anti-reservationists make when they claim that reservations ruin the chance of deserving upper caste people in the college and the job market. Of course, I thought they were right to be upset about that. But beyond these few moments of anxiety, my caste didn't bother me too much. That would not have been the case had I attended other Delhi University slash DU colleges. In most colleges in DU, which is Delhi University, the annual student elections are often criticized for being flashy and dramatic, are also heavily backed by student wings of prominent political parties, BJP, Congress, CPIM, JDU, ASU, etc. These elections are often fought along caste lines, with candidates from certain castes being fielded for certain posts. The elections have been criticized for allowing caste, money factors, et cetera, to rob the campus politics of a level playing field. These elections are banned at St. Stephen's and therefore its students are shielded somewhat from the caste-based bullying that is common in several DU colleges during elections and the rest of the school year. Other colleges of Delhi University, like several universities across the country, are steeped in caste discrimination, where Dalit students and faculty alike have to jump through hoops. Their identification as lower caste because of reservation makes them particularly vulnerable to discrimination and abuse from college authorities. Application forms get lost in the mail, theses are not approved in time, and scholarships remain stuck in back offices for months and even years. Not just in Delhi University, Dalit students face institutional bullying in most of the other state and central universities that are required to follow the reservation policy. At Hyderabad University, Rohit Vemula faced such discrimination. His grant was severely delayed 
until he ran out of money and was forced to live off the generosity of his friends and well-wishers. Most Dalit students understand the power the university system wields over their education and choose to duck their heads, blend in and comply. Unlike them, Rohit was an outspoken advocate for social justice and a student activist leader. He not only refused to overlook the systemic discrimination against Dalit students, but also vocally asserted his rights. In fearlessly announcing his Dalit identity and demanding justice for himself, Rohit possibly challenged a fundamental idea that many upper caste professors hold, which is that Dalit students study in Indian colleges and universities on their largesse. So they should be grateful for whatever crumbs they are thrown instead of taunting them by them being the upper caste professors and university administration by demanding more. In fact, Giri Shankar, an upper caste assistant professor at Kerala's Arnakulam Law College, screamed something along these very lines at a 24-year-old Dalit student by the name of Vaishak Diaz in December 2016. Vaishak had questioned the professor's criticism against male and female students dancing together at an art fest organized on campus. You belong to SCST category and you are studying here and staying in the hostel out of the mercy of the government and people like me. He had reportedly retorted. Vaishak was immediately suspended for verbally abusing the professor as he, along with the most other students present, had chanted a derogatory student that has circulated among the college students for decades. He only found out that the charges had been made against him. None of the other students were charged when he went to complain about the professor's casteist insult. The notion that constitutional reservation is an unfair government handout to schedule caste and tribes who obviously don't need it is absurd. It's a corrective measure that reflects the socialist policies of the nation state and is 1000 years overdue. The idea of undeserving students didn't spring up in a vacuum. It originated and was widely disseminated during two critical events in modern India's history. The Mandal Commission protests of the 90s and the anti-reservation protests of 2006. The All India Institute of Medical Sciences, known as AIMS in New Delhi, was the main hub for the 2006 protests. And they were widely covered by media channels. I remember watching those broadcasts on television as I saw the action unfold around me in real time in Delhi University. The protests took place in the summer following the release of Rakesh Om Prakash Mehra's movie, Rangde Basanti, in late January the same year. In the movie, five easygoing Delhi, Delhi University students turn into activists who lead an agitation against government corruption. The storyline is cleverly juxtaposed against the narrative of freedom fighters played by the same actors from the 1900s. Flashbacks of the five famous freedom fighters smoothly cuts to present day scenes of the same five actors being Amir Khan, Soha Ali Khan, Sharman Joshi, Siddharth Narayan and Gulal Kapoor. They're conspiring to take down a corrupt minister and attempt to justify the actions as patriotic and in national interest. Several scenes were shot in and around Delhi University, including at St. Stephen's, and many students appears, appeared as extras in the film. The five actors had spent part of the year touring various U colleges, and the pre-release publicity was intense many months before its release. Unsurprisingly, the movie opened to packed cinema halls and became a must watch for all Delhi University students who felt represented on screen. Moreover, the India Gate sequence, which had charged shots of the lead actors protesting against the corrupt system and the police brutality against them, had resonated widely. 
In particular, the police violence against 60-year-old character of Rahida Wahida Rahman, who plays the mother of R. Madhavan's character, the slain pilot of a crashed MiG-21 airplane, that scene had a lasting impact on the audience. The movie was celebrated for reviving the patriotic spirit in the nonchalant early millennials like myself. In this charged atmosphere, when the United Progressive Alliance, that is the UPA government, announced its plan to introduce additional reservation for the OBC, that is the other backward, category, uh, uh, other backward categories, in April, Youth for Equality, which is YFE, a student group based in Ames, the popular medical college in Delhi, found it very easy to mobilize the usually apathetic students. Cell phones were flooded with text messages urging students to gather at India Gate to stand up for what's right, that is, oppose reservation. The message was so effective that even I, someone who steered clear of politics at that time, particularly reservation, wondered if I was neglecting my patriotic duty by not attending the protests against reservation. Many students who were away for the summer didn't make it to the actual protests, but the message that quota students have it easy was reinforced forever. Despite limited participation, the protests which began when YFE, the student body, called for a nationwide strike on 13th May 2006 had some impact. Ames was the epicenter and the college administration openly supported the protesting doctors and students, providing them with tents, pillows, mattresses, and water coolers. The protests also sped, spread to the students of the Indian Institute of Technology, the Indian Institutes of Management, and some other medical and engineering colleges. Ames had no more than a handful of protesters, yet they grabbed me national media attention by turning away patients and even denying emergency health care at one of the most important hospitals in the country. Meanwhile, the pro-reservation protests, which also took place at the Ames campus, were brutally shut down by the police. Since the administration allegedly did not permit any agitations within 500 meters of its campus, they had relaxed that rule for the mostly upper caste do doctors and students who were protesting against reservation, obviously. Anti-reservationists shouted casteist slogans. They swept the roads and shined shoes to demonstrate that they were, in fact, the new Dalits. Television news channels ran the footage almost nonstop. Television coverage did not call out protesters on their casteism and allowed their viewers, most of them who opposed reservation to begin with, to frame a new narrative against it. The pro-reservation protests taking place a few meters away barely received any coverage. Almost a month of coverage in print and television news, after almost a month of coverage in print and television news, the Supreme Court of India ordered the doctors to call off the strike on 3rd June 2006. After the protests died down, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of the Government of India asked then Professor, asked the Professor Sukhdeo Thorat, who was then the University Grants Commission Chairman, to look into the complaints of caste-based discrimination and abuse against Ames faculty and administration, which had allowed the anti-reservation protests to happen on its campus. Thorat's report was released in 2007 and found 85% of ST, ST students who were the Dalit students and the Adivasi students, they disclosed that they had, did not have proper access to faculty who were generally indifferent to them and paid more attention to the upper caste classmates in practical and oral exams. Almost 76% reported that examiners wanted to know their caste and several students said that their grades dropped once it was known that they were from an SE or SD background. 
around 88% of SCSD students reported receiving fewer marks than they expected in theory papers. Postgraduate students complained that they were not assigned thesis guides, which made it difficult for them to access external academic opportunities like scholarships and conferences. SCSD students reported suffering abuse not only from their teachers, but also their peers, who would bully them because of their lower caste. Students talked about revolting ragging practices where new students were forced to reveal their caste in front of all students. And when discovered to be from a lower caste, senior students would yell invective and casteist slurs, asking why they didn't choose to study elsewhere. SCSD students then would be forced to sit on the floor while others sat in hostel room beds because they hadn't earned their seat by merit. SCSD students would also have to recite, recite examples of 10 reasons why I don't belong in this institution and were abused both physically and verbally if they didn't comply. These targeted hazing rituals ensured that even students from so-called caste-neutral backgrounds would become hyper-aware of the differences, creating casteist hierarchies where they didn't exist before. These hazing rituals are designed so that SCST students would start their years at AIMS and their careers feeling inferior while upper caste students held on to the sense of superiority. This kind of ragging, which is common in medical and engineering schools across India, is horrifically isolating and aims to dehumanize its victims so the oppressors would share no sympathy with them. They are created to duplicate the original rules of the caste system of denying education to Dalits in modern India. Specific to AIMS, the All India Medical Institute, these patterns of abuse and humiliation often follow SCSD doctors well into their careers. Many of them, like Mumbai resident Dr. Rohan Kamble, who wrote into documents of Dalit discrimination, are terrorized into giving up higher education. This also leaves this also leaves a lasting impact on the students' mental health. And as many of them come from poorer backgrounds, they find it impossible to thrive in a toxic academic environment. Of the 16 Dalit student suicides in North India between 2007 and 2013, two were at AIMS. Balmukund Bharti had topped his school in Bundelkhand and scored a high rank in the IIT entrance examination, which he gave up to join AIMS. Bharti belonged to the Chamar community, which is a lower caste community in India, and came from Kundeshwar, which is a remote village in Madhya Pradesh. He committed suicide in 2010 after repeated incidents of caste-based harassment. The college principal allegedly told him, you can never become a doctor because you don't have the brains. Dalit activist and documentary filmmaker Anup Kumar in his documentary series, Death of Merit, interviewed Bharti's parents who recalled their son's terrified reaction to the principal's dietary. Despite the obvious harassment, the college administration refused to take any responsibility for his death. Instead, blamed his lack of English language skills and his inability to cope up with the coursework. Less than two years later, in 2012, another ST student who was from the Adivasi community in India, Anil Meena, who was the second topper in the ST category of all India medical entrance exams, also killed himself. Kumar's documentary examines both their deaths and holds the college directly or indirectly accountable for them. But AIMS doesn't seem to reserve its casteism for its students alone. The SCST faculty also complained of illegalities in their hiring and promotion, according to the Thorat Committee report. 
While Dalit prof professors were denied rightful promotions, the empty seats were filled from the general category applicants in a willful neglect of the mandatory reservation policy. The Ames Reservation dismissed the findings of Thorat's report, questioned its methodology, and called it biased and unsubstantiated. Allegations of discrimination and intimidation are not unheard of in other higher education institutions as well. Rohit Vemula's death at Hyderabad University was not a one-off. Eight Dalit students had committed suicide right there in Hyderabad University between 2006 and 2016 alone. Rohit's uh, death. Yashika. Oh, all right. I understand should we, that. Should we transition are, into questions? How, how do you feel about that? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm glad you gave me that signal because I do think that this is a really good um, jumping off point into a question answer session and then we can keep talking more. But I do want to say that uh, these statistics are quite horrifying because you see that there is a clear pattern that emerges in the same educational institutions that, hold, that first of all harass Dalit students based on the affirmative action that they have availed and then take no accountability. And on top of which, they very easily blame the Dalit students themselves for not being able to cope with the pressure of the studies, which somehow all upper class students are able to sail through with a lot of ease. So yeah, Audrey, I uh, would love to discuss more you know, about reservation and about how institutional harassment takes place in Indian colleges and universities. Mm. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for that reading. Um, uh, you know, uh, obviously I've read your book multiple times, but hearing it in your, your voice is, is uniquely powerful. So one thing that I thought came, came across very strongly in the reading you just did is the, the value of sort of both statistics for sort of illustrating the extent of the problem, but then mixed with personal experiences to, to illustrate the price and the human cost of this. And so sort of taking that as a jumping off point, I wonder if, if I might ask you to comment on sort of your own personal experience um, and, and maybe just sort of start with why you wrote, wrote the book, right? I mean, given what you've just said, it seems like it would, would have been easier in a sense to not come out as Dalit. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts about what your inspiration was and why you felt like this move was, was important. Thank you so much for that question, Audrey. I, like you rightly said, it's not always the easiest decision to make to disclose someone's caste. In fact, for a lot of people, that's not even a choice. For a lot of people, they live, continue to live in the communities where they're, they are easily identified by their backgrounds, by the families they come from, by the family members, or live in small towns, small communities, that people are easily able to find out what their caste is. In my case, that was the case, that, that was the reality, that was my reality until I lived in Ajmer, which is a small town in Rajasthan. More or less, people knew who my family was, uh, what our caste was, and also because uh, my grandfather and my father were actually not manual scavengers anymore, but worked in government jobs and worked in pretty good government jobs at that. So people kind of knew of our story as it is, you know, but at the same time, um, there was also this idea that, you know, you could hide your past, but at the same time, you couldn't escape from that. So I grew up with a sense of deep shame and, and deep, um, I, would, I would call it emotional trauma, feeling that I belong to this family of manual scavengers, where even though we had risen to this point of, you know, so-called financial mobility, which didn't really translate. If you read in the book, you'll, you'll realize that I lived with a lot of income inequality myself when I was growing up as a, as a child in my family. But at the same, but you know, Sid, even then, um, my parents told me that I needed to hide my caste. The reason that they asked me to do that was because they didn't want to go through the same amount of 
discrimination and the kind of verbal abuse and emotional abuse, often physical abuse in the case of, you know, both my parents that they had endured in their experiences in school and colleges to translate to their children. So one of the most effective ways, something that a lot of um, Dalit families were doing at that time in India were changing their last names, were obscuring their caste markers. So at least, you know, if people didn't couldn't make the connections back to my family, they couldn't really identify that I came from a manu scavenging caste. And I was able to live with that concealed identity, yet feeling this great sense of shame about who I was till I, you know, till I was 30 years old. And I did not, like you said, it was a deep, um, it was a huge burden and I did not reveal my caste. I did not choose to expose myself to this kind of discrimination that comes with um, people knowing how, just how low my caste was. And I kind of paid a price for that. You know, it's a double-edged sword because while you can hide who you are, you still live with this fear, like the fear that I've mentioned in the pages of my book, that someone's going to find out, that someone's going to, you know, it's going to affect my job, it's going to affect my friends, it's going to affect my relationships, I might not get the, the promotion that I want, because, you know, we, we understand there is a, a report that recently came out by Al Jazeera that said that there are about only six um, Dalit journalists that were known at the time. That was after I revealed my identity as a Dalit person. So before that, there were barely any Dalit journalists who were, you know, um, writing in English language media, who were editors, for example. I just didn't see anybody around me who was like me, who came from a Dalit background and was, you know, if not proud of it, but at least accepted it and was, um, able to still build a successful career. So for, the, for me, the best course of action, the safest choice was to hide my caste. And I continued to do that while also feeling this kind of burden that you know I'm not good enough to be who I am. Otherwise, I wouldn't have to hide my, my identity as a whole. This is very similar to the concept of passing. The movie is out on Netflix just this week if you know the students and everybody who's tuned in want to watch that it's, a, it's the same kind of experience. If for survival, for the sake of survival, you can adopt the identity that is not marginalized to escape that kind of um, sharp and bald discrimination, then that's a fair and easy choice to make. But when I moved to New York, for the first time, I was able to um, escape this question of my caste. For the first time, I almost heaved a huge sigh of relief because I, everywhere I would go, the question of caste wasn't going to follow me. And it was only because I was here and I had that kind of objective distance from the shame and the fear and the self-loathing that I had experienced for all three decades of my life so far that I was able to look at my caste and question the caste system. I talk a little bit about the chapter in the chapter I read about internalized sense of casteism. And a lot of us grew up with that, where we feel that the idea that Brahmins are superior, that Kshatriyas are superior, and Dalits are inferior is true. If that wasn't the case, why would I need to hide who I am? Right. And then only when I moved here and I got access to this kind of education, especially, you know, the, the education about black movements in the country that challenged the systems at its core is when I learned that there was there was value in challenging my entire worldview. And then, of course, I read the letter by Rohit Vemula, who is who I talked about a little bit in the reading, who is the student activist from Hyderabad University who openly criticized the caste discrimination that was institutionally happening against Dalit students and paid a heavy price for it. He was institutionally murdered. And he wrote this beautiful last letter that he left, um, which, I mean, if you uh, have the time, I would really encourage you to look it up. In my opinion, it's the most, it's the single most important piece of Dalit writing in English that has been written so far. And, you know, he talks about how we're not just votes. We're not just statistics. We're not just data. You talk, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the importance of statistics, but Dalits, we have a whole life beyond that. You know, we are like the way he described that we are minds made of stardust. 
and that really if you any you it's impossible to not be moved by that but it spoke to me on a personal level because here i was hiding who i was hiding my identity and here and and in arguably a better position than rohit being in the united states and all and he is back home in the trenches fighting that discrimination actively and the price that he had to pay for that so that sort of discrepancy really spoke out to me and i also thought that having attained the uh, the education that i did from columbia j school i just graduated it was you know um early 2016 and i graduated in 2015 a couple of months ago and i realized that with all my media training with my years of experience as a journalist which you know um hiding my caste gave me a window seat to this upper caste world of journalism which i would never be allowed in. if i was openly a dalit journalist so i decided to use and channel that experience and create this tumblr website called documents of dalit discrimination because everywhere around me the narrative that i heard about dalits was of trauma and pain but not from our point of view of you know it was a narrative of othering us of sort of reducing our pain and just looking at us as numbers five dalits died today you know that was that was the headline that you heard about but nobody really talked about what happened to those dalits and their families what was the story until then what is the trauma that it is that the caste system inflicts on us that burdens us with physical violence and emotional violence and psychic violence so i decided that i would create this space for people like me and people who were dalit So I think we lost Yashika there. I assume she'll rejoin. So just to stick with us a moment, folks. All right. Hi, I think we lost no the connection yeah, for a little bit. The connection bit. was lost. Um no, that but that was a really powerful powerful answer. Um One thing that I think is really striking is it, you know, based on your narration, it seems that a combination of your your access to education, um, as well as distance from India, is what you feel kind of positioned you to 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 reclaim your identity in a new way, to articulate it in a new way. Um, and yet, as as you know, and as I know as well, um, caste is hardly. not an issue in the United States. Um and so I wondered if you could sort of comment a little bit about how you see caste and caste-based discrimination here. Um yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, first of all for anybody to think that caste doesn't exist in the United States is laughable if you're an indian person if you lived any amount of your life in india you have to understand that caste is just such an invisible but insidious part of indian reality and indian lived experience that of course it is going to travel with us in our suitcases with our achar ka dabbas you know which is the pickle jars that we carry or the laddus that our mums you know give us we carry caste along with that because you know the this idea that you know what is indian culture that we're preserving indian culture in uh, international places whether it's united states whether it's the uk germany anywhere else in the world that indian culture also means preserving caste there is a reason that people cannot join hindu hinduism jo- can't join the religion officially because you cannot adopt a certain caste you can practice hinduism but you have to be born a hindu the reason for that is that because your caste is attached with it so obviously in the united states we don't the, you know one of the reasons we don't hear caste we don't see caste is because over 90% of the indian american population is upper caste there have been surveys that have talked about this repeatedly and of course it speaks to the pattern of immigration that took place from the 60s till now which allowed only a certain kind of worker to come into the united states those workers were coming from iits and iams and as we just learned dalit students don't or always have access to these opportunities and therefore a bulk of the population in the us is upper caste and it is in their interest to hide 
uh, stories about caste. We are often told, um, you know, everybody talks about if you're Indian, uh, you're an Indian person or Indian origin, you understand that there is this whole idea that you shouldn't air your dirty linen, your dirty laundry in public. And caste is a part of that dirty laundry. It is a shameful secret. A lot of Indians are invested in hiding caste from the rest of the United States because it directly challenges our idea of being a model minority. Now, as we know in the US, South Asians in particular, Indians especially, are considered a model minority. We have a vice president of the United States. We have the CEO of Google. We have the CEOs. Everywhere in tech, we, are, we have people who are in politics doing so well. The idea that we haven't dealt with this demon of caste, which, is, which directly makes those people the oppressors, the oppressor castes, is contradictory to the narrative of this unproblematic minority that, um, that really has nothing wrong with it, that has nothing to be accountable for. So I guess that is one of the reasons that the general US populace or the mainstream US population doesn't hear about caste so much. It's because it's a deliberate effort to hide caste, to not talk about caste. Now, of course, a lot of the audience members who are Indian can say, but we don't see caste in our family. Well, of course you do. You just probably don't know how to recognize it. If you did, you would have a lot more Dalit friends around you because to be fair, Dalits are more than 25% of India's 1 billion plus population. Why do you not have Dalit friends? It's the same question. How many friends of color do you have if you're a white person? How many Dalit friends do you have? Have you heard from their experiences? Of course, as an upper caste person, you don't see caste because you have all the privileges of being the oppressed uh, the, op the oppressor castes, the dominant castes. You're able to come here, you're able to benefit from those structural and systemic privileges, and therefore you don't see how caste operates. But you have to understand that there are Dalits living in the United States who are not allowed to enter temples. This is an incident that was reported very recently, but it's from 2001 when this family living in Queens, New York, uh, was worried that as in the aftermath of the September 11 Islamophobic attacks on all they see people, they would face you know, some kind of violence. Instead, what they woke up to was uh, a, a stone thrown into their window. And then they went out and discovered that somebody had written a truth which is untouchable on their car because they are they were Dalits. They were Dalits living in Queens, which had an Indian community. And this discrimination goes far back, as far back as 2001, and I'm sure even further, it's just that we're talking about it now. Caste exists in the US in the workplace, as we saw with the Cisco case and HCL and so many other workplaces where Indians are in, uh, in a sizable amount. Even if there are five Indians on the table, the conversation of caste comes up and, and these narratives of who's superior versus who's inferior, they are already set in place. So, you know, whether it is from eating practices, questions about whether you are vegetarian or non-vegetarian, I mean, look at the language. Vegetarianism is this beacon of purity because the other option only exists in relationship to being a vegetarian. It's vegetarianism or non-vegetarianism versus vegetarianism or meat eaters. So the question is, are you veg or are you non-veg? And if somebody says, oh, I'm a non-vegetarian, then they will ask you further, do you not eat meat for religious, do you eat meat for religious reasons or personal or dietary reasons? So these are not, this is not concern for your health. These are questions that are very cleverly concealed to investigate what your caste is so that you can be placed on a certain scale of respect, of dignity, of equality, whether you uh, even deserve to be spoken to with any kind of respect the next time you are spoken with. That's what is happening when those questions are directed at you. There are examples where people have talked about, and that hasn't happened to me. Luckily for me, I don't work with a lot of Indians and it's a choice I've made very specifically to not do that. But I've heard from folks who don't have that privilege where men will, and this happens mostly between men, where they'll try and, and check for the sacred thread on the back. This is an experience you might have heard of, Audrey, as well, where, you know, somebody would just try and pat your back, but it's not just one pat. It's trying to suss out if you're wearing the sacred Brahmin thread. 
And that's one example. There are these Brahmin-only communities that exist, you know, not just Brahmin caste, but within the specific subcaste. Tamil Brahmins have their own networking groups, social media groups on Facebook, on Twitter, elsewhere where people communicate with each other and sort of have communities and have their own rituals, which are not open to anybody else. So that community-based gathering is already in place. To deny caste or the existence of caste is to uh, willfully be ignorant of this reality that exists all around us. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I don't know about anyone else, I found some of those words hard to hear. All right, and I will just I will just remind folks in the audience, this is the best of what higher education has to offer, right, is, is compelling people to see hard truths, um, including structures of oppression in which we may be implicated, okay? But let me now, I wanna ask you one more question, Yashika, and then, and then I'll, I'll turn to various questions that have been coming in. Um, and I wanna preface this question by saying, that, that this event, while open to the public, is also part of my history of Hinduism course. So this, this helps contextualize why I am asking this specific question. Um, you know, and, and the first time I read your book, one of the things that just blew me away was your sort of eloquent treatment of Ambedkar, right? The, the great intellectual and Dalit thinker. And I mean, I'll, I'll never see him the same again after, after seeing him through your eyes. And I'm the richer for it. Ambedkar, of course, argued quite forcefully that the caste system was an intricate and integral part of Hinduism, okay, an argument that still ruffles a whole lot of feathers today. Um, and of course, he rejected Hinduism towards, towards the end of his life, you know, for good. And so I wanted to just pose the question to you, how, how do you think about or, or formulate the relationship between caste and Hinduism? Um, I think there is no denying what Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar has said uh, in relationship to caste and Hinduism. I mean, I did not make this connection myself until I read Ambedkar and I've very openly talked about how I wasn't allowed to access Ambedkar because of my interna internalized fear of people finding out my caste. So I stayed away even from this symbolic gesture of reading Ambedkar or the symbol of caste pride. The, that is Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar because I was worried if somebody saw me reading Ambedkar's books, they would find out I'm Dalit and this entire lie that I had constructed my life on top of would fall to pieces. So I didn't allow myself to read Ambedkar and that was such a disservice because when I read him is when I realized this whole system of reality that I constructed in my head was a myth because this idea that I genuinely bought into that Brahmins are superior, that Dalits are inferior, and I have to preserve that sanctity, and therefore I must hide myself, was, um, it did not hold any water. I only learned that after I read Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, and this is, you know, what I'm about to discuss here is something that I haven't talked about before, is my personal relationship with Brahminical you know, ideas and ideology. I think I've touched a little bit in the book about how, you know, my parents, especially my mother, grew up in a very rigid society, compensating and always trying to be uh, adopted in this kind of Brahminical system. And for her, coming from a very small town, I wouldn't even call it a town, it's a village in Uttar Pradesh, in Western Uttar Pradesh, that was the only way to survive. And for her, it was really important to buy into this idea that we have to be purer than the Brahmins in order for us to be accepted by them. Now, of course, that didn't happen because this is a whole system that we are deliberately kept out of that we can we can know some things we can get a bhagavad gita and keep it in our house but there is no way we can learn an entire system so the whole you know my whole childhood was spent watching my mother struggle really hard to get an entry into hinduism and never quite fitting in always being worried that if she didn't follow this one particular ritual on this particular festival in the correct way then this whole idea that we are not good Hindus would fall to pieces. 
And I can now, because of those efforts or, you know, however my relationship with that is, I can now sit here and proudly say that I don't believe in any religion and I, I abhor organized religion and I, I choose to not be a part of the system at all, individually and personally. And of course, you know, this conversation has come up about what religion should Dalits follow? And, you know, if I may be candid with you, Audrey, you've noticed my Twitter feed for the past couple of weeks where people have been really not happy with me, not saying that what you should choose one religion over the other, you should renounce Hinduism, et cetera, et cetera. The only reason is I'm not in any position to say that to anybody. I really do believe in Dr. Baba Sahib's Ambedkar's, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, I, his ideal of secularism the choice to uh, the personal freedom to follow what you want to follow as much as i disagree with my mother's choices of wanting to be a good hindu which she is never going to be because she is a dalit woman she is never going to be a good hindu woman because she is dalit but as much as i disagree with that i respect her choice to follow it so therefore i'm not going to sit here and tell somebody whether they should reveal or hide their caste it's a personal choice what religion to follow because it's a deeply personal decision faith spirituality religion we one of the reasons that people get attracted to organized religion in my opinion is because especially people who are marginalized there is so much for us at stake there is so much for us that we have to lose. There is no recourse. There are no, there is, there are no handouts. The, you know, when you live in extreme and dire circumstances, when you live with income inequality, all you can do is pray to God that a loaf of bread shows up and that God is the one God that's around you. And I or anybody else cannot sit here and dictate to people that this is the God you should pray when you don't have roti in your house or dal in your house to eat. That's a personal choice. Now, of course, this is only my individual opinion politically and how political movements are shaped. And of course, Baba Sahib Ambedkar talked about converting to Buddhism. Those are political choices. I, I am in no position to adopt those stances. But personally, I think, I mean, if I may choose this platform to discuss or address this idea, I really believe in his idea of being secular and personal choice and having the freedom of religion. Having said that, there is no denying that Hinduism is the root of caste. Hinduism talks about how Brahmins born from the head of a god, you know, and uh, Kshatriyas are born from the chest and Shudras are born from the feet, and untouchables are not a part of any of that system. That's written in the Brahminical texts. That's written in Manusmriti. Manusmriti is one of the core tenets of Hinduism. A lot of uh, professors of religion who buy into this idea actually want to say Manusmriti is not important to Hinduism at all. We understand that it is because even if you divorce yourself from the idea of Manusmriti not being an important Hindu book, it still has an outsized influence in the way people live their life. Manushpati talks about pouring molten lead down the throat of Dalits if they learn Sanskrit, if they speak Sanskrit. It talks about how Dalits should not be allowed to touch books. And if they do, then the books are polluted because of their actions. So, sorry about that. So I was just talking about how Manushpati has these ideas about how Dalits need to be subjugated, how Dalits can be oppressed. It doesn't just talk about Dalits, however, it also talks about women, which if somebody is interested and you know, is interested in, uh, in you know, self-flagellation <laughs> and you're a woman, go read the Manusmriti because it talks about horrible behaviors and treatment of women, but also of Dalits. So there is, this connection is clear for everybody to see if you, choose to not see this connection, you still choose to talk about how caste is a British invention, then open your eyes. I mean, you are being ignorant, not because, you know, that's the way you're, you're choosing to be. You're choosing to not see what the truth is. And so with that, I'm going to turn to audience questions. Okay, so folks, we already have some coming in, but please do feel free to put more in the Q&A. And I'm just, I'm going to read them out. All right. Um, so one comes from Manish, who says, thanks for sharing. Did you experience caste discrimination in the USA? 
And what measures would you suggest to strengthen anti-caste awareness and change the casteist heart? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, thank you so much for asking that. I did not experience caste discrimination in the USA, but that's just my story. I did not experience caste discrimination because I chose to not be with Indians. I chose to not live in Indian communities. I chose to not work with Indians because after coming here, I achieved this kind of freedom in the truest sense. And of course, there are many problematic themes to that idea of freedom in the USA. But for personally, for me, it was freedom from cost. And I was not about to give that up by being a part of the Indian community again and have them subject or question my choices as a woman, as a Dalit woman, and, and sort of discriminate me all over again. So it's a very personal choice that I had the privilege of making because I was also a journalist. Now, if I was hired by a company that hires mostly Indians, then I wouldn't have that choice and I would be facing this discrimination in the workplace. So thankfully, I've been sort of uh, shielded from that only because I made very deliberate personal choices. But at the same time, what is it that you can do to sort of um, be, you know, have followed this anti-caste sensibility? One of the things you can do is to speak to your family members. Let them know that caste exists here. It's not an easy conversation to have, but that's the only way to be anti-caste. Speak to your folks at home who um, sort of maybe believe in these ideas of how they are superior, or you know, even if they don't actively practice that, talk to them about caste, talk to them about how this is a systemic idea that has been ongoing and sort of highlight to them and point out to them how caste is a part of, every fiber of Indian society, whether it's food, religion, music, dance, culture, you can look anywhere around you and you will see how caste is deeply entrenched in those aspects of Indian life. So my suggestion to you is to talk about with your folks, to talk about with your family members and to make sure that if you are in your peer groups, in your circles, do not tolerate anti-caste, casteist rhetoric to stand up for, you know, if possible, you know, if you have the opportunity, you, this doesn't need to be even said, but you have to stand up for Dalit students who are very likely, and in this moment as well, if they're on campuses, being discriminated by their uh, dominant caste peers. So, you know, stand up for your friends, make Dalit friends, and really make sure that no one's able to, at least around you, say that caste doesn't exist anymore. Thank, thank you for that. Um, and folks, since we're at Rutgers, just to note, we have had castus incidents at, at Rutgers University on multiple campuses. Okay, so, th so this is a deal, an issue that we, we deal with internally sometimes. The next question, uh, com I think is going back to, to the, the wonderful excerpt you read from your book. Um, the question is, how are school administrators able to get away with such horrific acts, especially after lives were lost? Um, that should tell you how skewed the system is against Dalits. They're not only able to get away, this is the dominant narrative. At least it's changing a little bit in the past five years. But before that, this has been the dominant narrative, Dalit students muddy the talent pool by just being in educational institutions. They shouldn't even be there because they don't have the talent. If they had the talent, why would they need the crutch of affirmative action? So it's, you know, that itself, this question should tell you that how they're able to get away with so much is because the society in general, the people who make these uh, rules and regulations, the people who have the power to change them, are all aligned on the same principle, are all aligned on protecting these upper caste interests. They themselves believe that Dalit students shouldn't be in these institutes and they don't have the talent and they don't have the brains, as one of the principals said to the student who committed suicide, to be doctors, engineers, or to run companies. This is a widely, this is a very widely accepted narrative within India. And which is why it's so difficult for people to talk about caste because these are internalized ideas. Dalits don't have merit. Of course they deserve to die. That, and, and I know that sounds really brutal, but 
really that is how most people think. One of the ways that we can change that is by talking about it, by creating awareness, by shifting public opinion, which has now begun to change. The needle has shifted ever so slightly in the favor of Dalits because more people are now talking about it. But for the longest time, that hasn't been the case. Administrators of schools and colleges and universities are constantly able to get away with casteist rhetoric, with casteist um, expressions against students by actively discriminating against them. And this happens because the principals, the faculty who have any power, the people who are overseeing this are all upper caste people. And that's why you know, when you have this kind of consolidation of power, there is no holding anybody accountable. Thank you for that explanation. Sorry about that. Um, I, would, I would also add to that just from, from a faculty perspective. Um, it, it, we faculty often get more pushback for teaching about caste-based discrimination than for enacting caste-based discrimination. Even in the United States, I and many of my colleagues do face pushback simply for teaching about this. Next question is, this is a good one. I wanna hear you say this one, from Abhi. He says, I'm sorry you're going through this. Do you think Dalit discrimination, discrimination against Dalits will stop in India? Oh, wow, this, <laughs> I really love the hope that you offer in this question and I applaud that. And what I'm about to offer you is probably a painful answer, but I really don't think it's going to stop. Because, you know, these answers are never that simple. Can we today stand in the U.S. and say, is police brutality going to stop against Black people, against Black men, Black women? The pro answer is probably no. So to answer your question briefly, it's not going to stop. But there is a possibility for us to change that by holding these people accountable, by creating press that talks about these issues when they, when they happen, when this violence, when this happens, by having Dalits in positions of power who can change things, who can enact these laws. I want to tell you that the laws against holding people accountable already exists. Untouchability is outlawed in India, yet it is practiced very commonly as recently as 2019. There is a survey that came out that untouchability is untouchability in India is widely practiced as you know, with as simple as people not allowing Dalits inside their kitchens or giving them uh, different utensils to eat from because their touch is polluted. So these are practices that are ingrained in um, the fiber of Indian societies. That's not going to change unless we try really hard for it, which is why questions and, and conversations like these are extremely important because they move the public needle ever so slightly, you know, and, and we can only hope that we are making this process easier for the generations that do come after that. Because, you know, these changes take generations to manifest. There is hope that, you know, as we are in 2021, by the late, uh, the later half of this century, the idea that caste doesn't exist will, uh, you know, people will stop, people will stop questioning that. People will not ask, why are we talking about caste when it is a thing of the past? Hopefully people will understand that caste is a present reality. So, you know, the, the, Task is very far sighted, you know, to say that whether that's going to stop today or in a couple of years from now. It's the same question as we you know when Obama was the president and people said we are post race and then we got President Trump in the next season of Indian of American elections in the next term. So, you know, the race didn't stop existing. It's the systems that are so old and so well oiled and so well established that need to be challenged and broken from within. Only then changes, real changes can happen. Very well put. So in the vein of change, okay, the, this next one's a few sentences. This is from Joseph. Hi, thanks so much for everything you've said so far. On the topic of Ambedkar, he makes it very clear that caste is a particularly harsh form of class. 
Given this, is the struggle for Dalit liberation inherently tied to a class struggle? And would tactics for class struggle, such as organizing and anti-capitalist politics, potentially be useful in the struggle against casteism? That's a really interesting question, Joseph. Um, I would like to learn from some of the sources where you mentioned that Ambedkar equates class to caste. Because in my understanding, Ambedkar talks about caste as a form of discrimination that starts at birth. And as we know, class origins can change. Within a person's lifetime, we can travel between class very easily, but there is no way to travel between castes. Now, of course, the, you know, whether it is the anti-capitalist movement or the forms of organizing, they go hand in hand. And that's something that we need to take into account. But caste is also its own beast. It, I think this is a mistake, if I can call it that, that a lot of people, especially on the left in India, have made as well. In fact, it's in fact, I like to rephrase. This is not a mistake. This is a weapon that they have used to solidify the position as dominant castes by saying caste is class. And therefore, if you transcend a class, then caste discrimination stops existing. It's the same question. Do black folks who are not on the margins of poverty, do they not face discrimination? How is that tied to the anti-capitalist struggle? I think the answer lies in very parallel and similar ways because caste I would like to dispel this myth for you, is not class. You can, if, if that was the case, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you, arguably by all markers, having transcended class, which is not true because I don't get paid for anything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I wouldn't be here talking about why caste discrimination is important, how people like me face it. Why is the, you know, in the Cisco case, the John Doe, the Dalit engineer who talked about the case, why is he talking about caste? He is very well paid. We know that H-1B uh, visa is sort of uh, immigrants who come to the United States have to be paid extremely well. Arguably, he transcended class, but he still faced the discrimination on the basis of caste. So I would urge you to be very careful when you make that distinction because caste is not class. Caste is similar to race, but it's not race either, but it's a useful way to think about how caste operates. It's not something that you can give up or escape from. Even people like me who try to conceal their last names never truly escape our caste. We just internalize it, internalize that shame and hatred in very different ways. So the next one's a little bit different. Uh, so focusing more on the US context. This is from Anil. The people who believe in Vermontical supremacy, what is their attitude towards African-Americans in the United States? Um, it's hard to say for me how a certain section of people believe in, um, you know, and how they, how they feel for black people in the US, black folks in the US. But it's not, it's not difficult to talk about how, if you're at the totem pole of one kind of superiority, your solidarity lies with people who lie on the high side, on the high point of the other pole as well. Brahminical superiority is parallel to white supremacy. And in fact, there is data, as you know, Audrey, I'm sure you've talked about and would be able to, you know, talk about a little bit more as well, where in, you know, Brahmins have used in the 19th century, in the 18th century. So another lost, lost connection. I'm sure, I'm sure Yashka will be back momentarily and then we'll continue folks. I am so no, sorry. I, no I'm not sure what happens. happens. Zoom so is I, so much fun, right? Okay, you, you were saying. I was just saying that Brahmins have used eugenics to argue that they are white and therefore they should be treated as in the same with the same respect as white folks in the United States and elsewhere in the world. In fact, there is a really fun, uh, popular case of immigration in the United States, which is called, uh, which is goes by the name of Bhagat Singh Thind, where he argued that he should not be 
treated as a brown person because he is an upper caste and therefore is closer to being a white person than he is being brown. So this is like a very interesting case of uh, from an immigration perspective, of course, but also it shows it's, it reveals how Brahmins think of themselves as white people. And now when you come to that, from that perspective, it's not hard to draw the line about where the solidarity lies with Black folks. Now, I'm not saying that there are no Brahmins in the United States who truly believe in, in Black Lives Matter or other related movements, but <clears throat> to talk about solidarity with Black folks and then to oppress your own people back home speaks of a different kind of hypocrisy. It really shows that authentically you support nothing. You talk about Black Lives Matter, you have a Black square on Instagram because it's the woke thing to do, because it keeps that facade of model minority up for you. But if you were really interested in dismantling these systems that you claim to, to be against, then you have to dismantle the casteist systems that you're upholding back home as well as here as well. So one doesn't really work without the other, if that's you know like a long way answer to your question. But I cannot comment on whether they're sympathetic to black folks, but I can say that their sympathies lie with white supremacists more than they lie with black people. I'm gonna do one more question from the audience and then I'll have a final question from me just to exercise moderator privileges in closing. All right, so next question from the audience is, does colorism play a role in the treatment of Dalits and lower castes in India? Absolutely, great question. Um, colorism is, really important when it comes to identifying or potentially identifying who's from a lower caste versus who is from an upper caste. That again goes into these roots of Brahmins equating themselves with whiteness as, you know, as flawed that system is. However, it's not always worth. If you look at me, I look like a light-skinned person. Of course, back in India, I'm fairly dark-skinned. And in the memoir, I've talked about how I had to grow up using so many ingredients, whether it was bleach or skin lighting ingredients, because my mother was worried that my darker skin color would reveal our true caste origins. So definitely there is this deep relationship where lower caste people are perceived to be darker and vice versa. However, it doesn't always work because in southern parts of India, where a majority of people are dark skinned, so you cannot really pinpoint whether if you're dark, your caste is also upper or lower. But for certain, colorism plays a huge role, if not direct, but it is also equated with being dirty, with being polluted, because this whole idea of being a Dalit or, or uh, you know, being an untouchable person is that you're dirty, you're polluted. And if your skin tone is darker, that is equated to being dirty. It's because according to some people, that's the dirt you can't rub. So, you know, Dalits like myself, um, we try hard uh, or our parents tell us to try, try hard to make sure that we look lighter so we can pass better. So last question is coming from me. All right, in our last six minutes here. I wanted to ask you, Yashika, not what you would say to, but what would you say about cast apologists? Okay, with the, with the context being that in, in discourses in the United States right now, we have a lot of cast apologists, right? People who are invariably from an upper caste background and have sort of appointed themselves as the arbiters of all things related to Hinduism in India. And they speak very strongly ag against pointing out caste and pointing out caste-based discrimination and, and cry foul anytime that people do, pursuant, as you well know, to, to preserving their own privilege. This is something I think that, especially for those of us who are not from a South Asian background, this is hard. It's, it's hard to understand and it's even harder to know what to say and do about it, right? Especially when people are screaming at you for being racist by pointing out caste-based discrimination, right? What would, you, what would you say about caste apologists? And are there any sort of tools or thoughts you would give folks who 
want to be allies in this movement and yet find themselves sort of in, in crosshairs. You just have to hand it to them, right? Look at how brilliant the strategy is. You know, they've not only worked to actively preserve these systems for decades, for generations in the US only, mind you, because back in India, caste is thousands of years old. They've not only worked to preserve that, they have devised tools to make sure that they can stop any kind of uh, opposition or any kind of call outs from outside the community, because within the community, Dalits don't have any power. People who do have power are non-South Asians and they can shut them up by calling them racist. It's, you have to, it really makes you think how strategic and well-organized this ideology, this thinking, this movement has to be and how important it must be for them to preserve their own positions of power and privilege that they come at this question so hard. The fact that they, like you said, cry foul every time somebody mentions caste shows the kind of insecurity they experience because they understand that they are literally standing on a house of cards. And especially being in the US, where they don't have that kind of power as white folks do, because ultimately they are brown, where however Brahminical they would like themselves to be in the racial order of superiority, they're unfortunately for them, very low. So they would like for, for people to not talk about caste at all, because they feel that, again, like I mentioned, that contradicts with their narrative of model minority. If they are insecure about talking about caste because it makes them feel that the little power they can snatch from this system, and there is a reason if you know, there is, there, there is a sociological reason why Indian Americans have been so successful in the US. And of course, immigration is one of them. Immigration patterns is one of them. But it's also another one of them is aligning themselves very easily with white supremacist ideas and sort of being the brown sahibs. They are called the brown sahibs because they, although they are brown, they still carry this privilege of being an upper caste person. So what one can say about this whole structure is that the reason there is so much time, effort, energy, and money put into preserving it is because it means something to people. It represents a certain kind of power and privilege that people are extremely scared to, to lose and, and to give up. Now, as far as the racial question is concerned, I mean, this is something that they brought up in the California textbook, textbook case issue as well, where they said that, you know, if... Um, you include the mention of caste in Californian textbooks, then people will use that to bully Indian students. And they had these, they had these crying children, they had these crying children um, go up and offer their testimonies about how hard it is when uh, white students and black students and East Asian students ask them about caste and how it's a problem for them because they have to acknowledge caste-based discrimination exists. They have flipped this whole narrative on its head because there are, no, there, there are very few, and, it's, and of course in the US now, there are powerful dissenting Dalit voices, but so far they've been able to successfully clamp them down. And only their narrative has been the single narrative, especially you know, in the racial order that exists in the United States, there is a lot of effort to assimilate. There's a lot of effort to celebrate diversity and a lot of upper caste Indians use this as a cover to perpetuate their caste-based practices. They say, this is Indian culture. Therefore, if you say anything against Indian culture, you're being racist, but that's a non-nuanced narrative that is, a really that that is like saying uh, that uh, Germans have nothing to be apologetic about, and if uh, students learn about Nazi Germany, that German students uh, feel attacked by that education. It's the same thing as what we are seeing now uh, with you, you, in the schools and colleges, in the schools at least in in the United States, with the critical race theory, where people are saying, "Don't learn about race, don't teach about race," because it affects our white students. So 
if white supremacists are making that argument and caste supremacists are making that argument, then you have to understand that race has nothing to do with it. Just because you are a racial minority doesn't absolve you from being an oppressor caste. Those stakes, those realities exist at the same time and they both need to be challenged. They both need to be taken into account. I'm not saying South Asians who are upper caste don't face racial discrimination. Of course they do. But a racist person is not going to ask their caste. Their own community members will. So if you're an ally, if you are a non-South Asian person, I would encourage you to learn and read about these ideas and issues, follow the lit voices, hear what they're saying, and really counter their arguments. Because the fact that it's racist to point out caste is BS, because when has it ever been racist to stand up for the marginalized? When has it ever been racist to stand up with the oppressed? That, is, that cannot be a racist phenomena because pointing out that Indians in the United States have these positions of power and privileges, which they keep Dalits out of, that is a fact. That is not a racist interpretation of ideas that is cold hard truth. And it's not racist to say the truth, that that just needs to be discussed more. I think that is a wonderful note to end on. It is never racist to stand with the marginalized and the oppressed. Everyone, please do join me in thanking Ms. Yashika Dutt. This was wonderful. I really appreciate you doing this and taking the time. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate being here, especially like I mentioned in the beginning, Rutgers is such an important institution and had there have been instances of class-based discrimination. So I'm really happy that I was able to come here and talk about this. Thank you for the opportunity and thanks for listening. Absolutely. Everyone take care, have a great night, all right? For my students, I'll be in touch. Bye everyone. Bye -bye.